a lone German submarine on its final voyage. This was actually a suicide mission. So we were quite more or less resignated that we made it come back. A crew of five German officers, 55 sailors and 12 passengers, risking their lives in the final days of World War II. This trip was a tremendous experience for me. I was lucky that I came out alive. And uh, this is one thing that I should never forget. The chances were 50-50. In reality, they were much worse. But that we did not know because losses were never revealed. It was clear to all of us, the war was lost, and nobody wanted to be a part of this mission. Our morale was non-existent. The end is near. The situation was rather desperate. The Russians were moving close to Berlin, and, uh, the, and the France was occupied, and even the Rhine was partly occupied. So it was quite a desperate situation. American troops are striking at the heart of Germany. Hitler's armies are crumbling. The Allies are winning the war. Germany was already beaten. There was nothing left anymore. The cities had been bombed to the ground. Everything was destroyed. By then the war had become completely senseless, but still millions were being sacrificed. Bombs rain on Germany. The Allies are laying waste to the entire country. Germany is drowning in destruction. Despite the continued bombing, parts of Kiel Harbor are still operating. The submarine docks. One boat is being prepared. Its name, U-234. The boat had been moved to the Germania yard for refitting. We, the crew, were not told why and for what reasons the boat was being refitted. There were rumors that we were going on a long and dangerous mission, but why and where we were going that was kept secret from the crew. In the submarine bunkers, U-234 is a modified mine layer, the largest submarine still in service. To the surprise of the crew, the boat is not being prepared for the defense of Germany. U-234 is to become a cargo submarine. I remember that the captain himself did not know what was coming on board. He only received a sealed cargo list. Lieutenant Commander Heinrich Fehler, he is not an experienced submarine skipper. This will be his first combat mission. After grueling losses, he is the best skipper the Navy can muster. Before we left uh, to the submarine, we had a big party. We had plenty of food, quite in contrast to what we did before, we were often quite hungry. And there was caviar and all kinds of things that we knew that existed in the during the war. And uh, the guests were admirals and uh, big party bosses. And uh, their big uh, toasts were given. And the need for our mission was very clearly pronounced. Karl Ernst Pfaff, second wash officer. He is one of the few aboard U-234 who know the destination of their voyage. The mission was to go and uh, bring a load of material to Southeast Asia. 
Pfaff supervises the loading of U-234. He directs the payload crew as they fill up every inch of the U-boat with boxes and crates. Some of the cargo comes aboard in sealed containers. These are stored in the box keel, deep in the belly of the submarine. Nobody knows what is in them. I only knew that it was so many boxes with a certain designation and it had to be recorded and I couldn't care less what was really in it. Pfaff completes the cargo manifest. He finds out who is supposed to receive U-234's freight, the Japanese army. By spring of 1945, Germany has already lost 70% of its U-boats. Three out of four submariners are dead. Captain Fehler knows his men's chances of survival are slim. March 25, 1945. U-234 finally leaves Kiel and enters Allied-controlled waters. From now on, Fehler and his crew are at the mercy of their enemy. Allied intelligence broke the German Enigma code in mid-1943. American and British commanders receive regular briefings on what the enemy is up to. No German military secret is secure anymore. That includes the departure of U-234. On board the submarine, it is an arduous journey. The U-boat remains submerged for days in order to avoid detection. It is cold, the air is foul, and it is more crowded than usual because the crew shares their cramped quarters with some very important passengers. Highest ranking among them, Luftwaffe General Ulrich Kessler. I was only told that my father was assigned to Tokyo as Air Force attaché. Kessler is an air defense specialist. Also on board U-234, Kessler's adjutant, Erich Menzel, in the spring of 1944, the Japanese were having more and more problems defending themselves. Their war machine was conceived only with offensive measures in mind. It was useless for defense. And when Midway and Hiobima fell, the Japanese foreign minister and the war minister requested specialists from the German government to help beef up their air defense. Spezialisten nach Japan schickt, dass die Luftverteidigung angepasst wird. In the bunk next to Menzel, a young navy officer, Heinz Schlicke. I was the scientist who worked in the high command of the German navy. My mission was to uh, make contact with the Japanese. That was part of the whole mission, to help the Japanese to revitalize the submarine warfare because we had tremendous losses. The loading list of U-234. It contains an inventory of each and every item Schlicke and the other passengers have on board the submarine. Only later did I learn how valuable and important the scientific material was that we carried. There were several tons of blueprints which described in detail Germany's latest weapons technology. Also on board the U-234, a fully functional ME-262, the world's first operational jet fighter plane. It is dismantled and stored side by side with components for the V-2, the latest achievement in ballistic missile technology. Research papers from Germany's premier weapons development projects. Navy scientist Schlicke carries most of them in his baggage. 
I was told I had to kill myself if I got caught and also to destroy all the scientific apparatus and papers I had on board. Packed to the brim with scientific experts and highly sensitive war materials, U-234 continues on its clandestine mission. But only two passengers on the submarine know how critical the mission truly is. Lieutenant Commander Hideo Tomonaga and Lieutenant Genzo Shoji, high-ranking officers of Japan's Imperial Army. My father studied aeronautics, and Mr. Tomonaga studied submarine warfare. They were both on the submarine together. The German crew does not know why these Japanese officers are on board. They were always very friendly. We talked to them, and very often during conversation, the subject came up how once we had arrived in Japan, we would learn their language and meet their families. Before he left for his last voyage, my husband was very careful not to let me know how dangerous this mission could be. He convinced me that I should wait for him and that he would return unscathed very soon. Tomonaga and Shoji had been in Germany for a year and a half, studying weapons and tactics of their German ally. Now, the two officers are returning to Japan aboard U-234 in order to help their country in its desperate struggle for survival. He did not complain about the country. And just like people in those days, he was devoted to the country and the emperor, in principle and in spirit. Before the departure of U-234, Tomonaga and Shoji conduct a sacred military ceremony in the tradition of the samurai. The Japanese officers gave their samurai sword to Captain Failer as a symbol, which means in Japanese military tradition, I do hereby give my life into your hands. To the German crew, the Japanese officers are different, and they don't understand them. When the boat was being loaded, the Japanese officers were on board. And before the boxes were brought down into the cargo hold, they were painting U-235 on them. We were laughing at them because they did not even know our hall number, U-234. But the Japanese know exactly what they are doing. They are not referring to a U-boat call sign. They label the boxes according to what is really in them, uranium oxide, which contains U-235 the raw material for an atomic bomb. And that is what U-234 is carrying to Japan. Berlin, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. This is where it all begins. Germany is the birthplace of nuclear science. In 1938, nuclear fission was discovered by Otto Hahn. Now, with the war raging, the German military wants an atomic bomb. They ask this man to build it for them, Werner Heisenberg. When the war broke out, it was clear that Germany was working on these uh, thoughts as well, and uh, that uh, my father, being one of the key 
people in the country would play a key role in such a project. Heisenberg is brilliant, a physicist at the height of his career when the war breaks out. We knew that the scientists in Germany were working on it. There was, of course, Hahn, who had discovered the fission of uranium. Heisenberg knew that you could convert uranium into plutonium and decided that this is what they wanted to do and that then the plutonium could be used as an explosive. The search for a weapon that would decide the outcome of the war is also underway in Japan. The Emperor needs a miracle to stop the American onslaught. They urgently needed an advanced weapon because the Japanese military realized they were facing the beginning of the end. My father was told there was a German submarine that was going to Japan and that he should come back with a written plan for a new weapon. And Tomo Naga is bringing back more than that. He has with him the material that could make this weapon possible. Empire of the Rising Sun. But in 1945, the sun is obscured by dark clouds. The Americans are threatening the Japanese mainland. And this man is supposed to stop them. Yoshio Nishina. Dr. Nishina was asked by the Air Division of the Japanese Army to undertake this project. When I joined, the project had already been underway for more than a year and a half. Tokyo, Riken Laboratory. In this building, Nishina and his staff are trying to do what Werner Heisenberg is also attempting in Berlin, build a nuclear bomb. But they are facing an obstacle that even makes pure research a daunting task. We did not have enough uranium in Japan. Dr. Nishina telegraphed the Japanese embassy in Germany and made an inquiry. He wanted to arrange a shipment of uranium to Japan. We knew the Germans had it. It's July 1943. The Japanese ambassador in Berlin receives a secret telegram. Tokyo urges him to arrange export of uranium from the mines in Joachimsthal, one of the few sources of natural uranium in Europe. Over and over, the Japanese request help from Berlin. They desperately need the German uranium. The Japanese ambassador, Hiroshi Oshima, personally pleads with the German government. There was quite a lot of pressure on Dr. Nishina. I remembered being called into his office, where he instructed me to hurry up with the program. The flurry of urgent telegrams continues. Finally, the Japanese ambassador secures a high-level meeting with Hitler himself. The dictator agrees. Japan should receive German help. Hitler orders that the Japanese be afforded any assistance regarding all weapons and devices which could be used to the advantage in the common cause. A 
A Japanese submarine arrives after 30,000 miles through enemy-controlled waters. It is one of the precious few that survive the dangerous journey. By now, this is the only way for Japan and Germany to keep their military cooperation alive. There were two or three submarines coming from Germany loaded with uranium, but they never arrived. These were Japanese submarines. I heard they sunk at sea, close to Malaysia. But one German submarine carrying uranium is still on its way. As U-234 makes its way across the Atlantic, the Allies assemble more and more information on the mission with the help of the most recent ultra-intercepts. They start piecing together how important the submarine is. The Allies don't know much about the cargo, but realize the value of the passengers aboard U-234 and that they need to be stopped. The U-boat comes under attack repeatedly. Allied air patrols and hunter-destroyer convoys seem to know exactly where to look for U-234. I think we were 650 feet deep, and at 500 feet, you could already hear the rivets creaking. As an engineer, I knew that if there was a crack the size of a pinhead, the pressure would be so enormous, the boat would break apart. I always feared for my life when I was on this submarine. We had sometimes 200 depth shots per hour, and then the lights went out, and the uh, water broke in, it had to be fixed. And uh, we had to be very quiet, no talking, no movement, uh, or, uh, and uh, sometimes it lasted many, many days so that we didn't have any fresh air, and we got all kind of woozy and felt very uncomfortable. You are afraid. You are in this machine and you can't see a thing. You can only hear. You cannot defend yourself. You have to imagine. It is similar to sitting inside a barrel of gasoline and somebody is hitting it with a sledgehammer from the outside. We went down as far as 900 feet. The submarine was not constructed for this, but we had no other choice. We needed to go down that deep. The Allies had no idea. They thought the boat was warned for no more than 300 or 350 feet. And that is how they configured the depth charges. They were able to tell these things when to detonate. And because we were so deep, the bombs exploded well above our submarine. The hunt for U-234 continues relentlessly. In order to escape, the submarine descends deeper and deeper. After more than two weeks, a reprieve for U-234. A spring storm rages over the Atlantic. It is the only time Captain Failer dares to surface without fear of being spotted by the Allies. I went on deck as a lookout. 
I was buckled up and had two towels around my neck. It was an incredibly scary ride. The boat thrust through the heavy seas, then it plunged down. We could hardly breathe, and then to the top of the waves again for two hours. That's how long our shift was. For a moment, in the midst of the elements, the war seems so far away. Berlin, the very same day. An orgy of death and destruction rings in the final hours of Hitler's Germany. We were all bracing ourselves for the end. We knew it would not last much longer. On the radio, we heard the Russians were entering the outskirts of Berlin, street fighting in the capital. We were expecting that today, or tomorrow, or the next day, the war would be over. May 2nd, 1945. The generals who stayed with Hitler until the end are leaving the bunker. The Chancellery. From here, the dictator directed his war. Finally, the war he unleashed returns. Twelve years of Nazi rule are over, and Hitler is dead. Hitler's successor, Admiral Karl Dönitz. Now that Germany has lost the war, his only remaining task is to order the armed forces to surrender. From his provisional headquarters in northern Germany, he records a special radio message to the submarines that are still at sea. My U-boat men. My U-boat men. Six years of war lie behind us. You have fought like lions. An enemy with oppressive material advantage has contained us on our exceedingly small territory. From this remaining base, a continuation of our struggle is impossible. You boat men, unbroken and immaculate, you laid down your arms after a heroic fight. Long live Germany. But not every German submarine surrenders. First, we decoded the official radio message. The war was over. Then we tuned into foreign radio stations. I listened to the broadcasts in English in order to find out, is this really the truth? It is. Victory celebrations in London. England withstood Hitler for five long years. The same joyous affair in Paris. The people of Europe are free from war. But the war is still not over for U-234. The submarine is still slowly making its way across the Atlantic. The atmosphere on board is tense. Captain Fehler knows they will never reach Japan. Should they surrender? And where? Captain Fehler has to decide what to do. Fehler had got all the officers together and told us that uh, the war had ended and Germany had to capitulate it and we had an order from the uh, high command of the German Navy to report our position uh, as a submarine, of course, surface and uh, bring up the periscope to full length and put a black flag on it and uh, report our position to Allied forces for surrendering. Captain Fehler summons the entire crew for an important meeting. He wants to hear what his men have to say. Okay. 
as far as there's the feeling since it's over we want to go home some said they wanted to go to Argentina another group wanted to go to the Caribbean it was all a lot of silly stuff in reality the options are few failure must surrender or be treated as a pirate that means he has to give up to the Allies and soon the Atlantic was uh, divided in certain sectors and we were in the sector that uh, would normally have required us to continue on our way and go to Halifax, Nova Scotia. But uh, the captain decided he would rather hand the submarine over to American forces. A fatal decision for the Japanese passengers. They are still at war with America. The Japanese officers did not realize what had happened until the captain informed them. They were put under arrest in their bunks because there was a concern that Captain Tomonaga, an excellent submarine officer, would have been very capable of sinking the ship and its crew. Mr. Tomonaga was a submarine expert. He could have sunk the submarine for good if everybody had been ready to sacrifice their lives with the boat. For the Germans, the war was over by then. But for the Japanese, the war was still going on. Both Mr. Tomonaga and my father must have believed that they should not sacrifice other people's lives. And that's why they chose death by themselves. My husband prepared sleeping pills. As a Japanese soldier, being captured was the ultimate shame. To prevent that, he had to kill himself. If he used a bleeding method, that would stain the boat. So he favored sleeping pills. He took them from Mr. Soji, lying on a bed. The German guard becomes suspicious. The Japanese have not stirred in hours. He finds them lying in their bunk, motionless. In front of their beds, on a little table, an empty water glass, personal photographs, and a letter. Committing suicide is better than surrender. This is the samurai spirit, which has been preserved in Japan for a long time. If you are captured, it is a disadvantage for our sacred country. Surrender is a great shame for a samurai that is what we learn as children. The death will be sad and not happy, but Japanese cannot think of it any other way. The Suicide Note. Last words of the dying men. Tomonaga and Shoji have only one request. Please let us die in peace and bury our bodies at sea. U-234's mission is finally over. It is May 13th. Captain Failer surfaces the submarine. Allied destroyers pick up a faint radio transmission. A German submarine broadcasts its position. U-234 is ready to surrender. 
Then the race began among the competitors, America and Canada. Everybody wanted the big prize, and the question was, who would be the first to reach us? As soon as the Americans find out which boat is about to surrender, they are determined to be the first to reach it. The captain indicated that this was a very valuable prize, uh, that there was all sorts of things very important to the war effort for us as well as for the Japanese, that the technology was superior. The German had the technology. U-234 deliberately radios the wrong coordinates to its Canadian pursuers. The ploy works. Failure sends them on a wild goose chase. And U-234 heads straight for the American destroyer, USS Sutton. The skipper, the Sutton, finally figured out that the German commander did not want to surrender to Canadian forces. And that, uh, so we decided we would run flank speed as fast as we could on a course to intersect, intercept their course. And sure enough, on May 14th, U-234 becomes visible on American radar screens. The U-boat is running eight knots in a southwesterly direction with no intention to escape again. It did not take very long before I had radar contact with the ship. And the captain asked me, how long before it is here? I answered three to four hours. And indeed, that was the case. Five hundred miles off Newfoundland, the USS Sutton pulls alongside U-234. Well, it was magnificent. It was a superb machine. It was just superb. And then we found out it was bigger than we were. The next morning, a prize crew came on board, Americans armed to their teeth. The American officer publicly announced an order by Admiral Kincaid, commander of Allied forces. You are now prisoners of the United States. Uh, the crew and passengers of U-234 do not know what to expect from the Americans. After this long and cruel war, will the victors hate them? But the American sailors treat them with decency. <laughs> 10 a.m. May 19th, 1945, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The last German submarine pulls into an American port. This was the greatest moment. Solid ground under our feet. We said to ourselves, there is one good thing. We escaped with our lives. Maybe not without damage to our soul, but at least without damage to our lives. The last roll call of U-234. The crew on deck. What will happen to them now? What of their families back home in Germany? Is there a future? We realized that, that these were kids, like we were kids. We're out here trying to destroy these kids, and they're here trying to destroy us. Just unfathomable. Two other submarines have already surrendered in Portsmouth, but this time, everything is different. On instructions by the Naval Yard commander, reporters and radio newsmen are kept at bay. Marine guards even have orders to shoot anybody who attempts to speak with the crew of U-234. Captain Failer concludes his final mission. For almost 60 days, he braved an enemy and an ocean without losing a single crew member. Failer is the last officer to disembark from the boat. The passengers are next. Heinz Schlicke. 
get comes in our face, each hole get in our body was thoroughly searched. ATBS must have thought we were all criminals. For the reporters, this man seems to be the biggest catch. A high-ranking Nazi general, complete with jack boots and leather coat. Ulrich Kessler. POW number 3WG1269. But this POW will become much more important to the Americans. Second watch officer, Pfaff. We were taken off the ship and marched into Kittery, Maine, uh, Navy prison, Navy prison. And there we were searched and then uh, uh, relieved of any valuables that we had, such as money or watches. And uh, but keep, could keep all our clothes, everything that we had, and were put in cells. The prison. A dark, forbidding place. Now the interrogations begin. The Americans are looking for someone who can tell them about the cargo. During the interrogation, they knew more about me than I knew myself. They told me before the departure you were here and then there. I couldn't even remember that myself. They knew everything, all of it, about everybody. While the interrogations are underway, the Americans begin to unload the submarine. When I went down uh, uh, to the dock, in the bottom of the dock, and we started unloading the box keel, I had no idea of what we would find or how important it would be. Finally, the Americans find the cargo manifest. Item number 38, a chilling detail. 560 kilograms of uranium oxide. Uranium aboard a captured German submarine. The news spreads like wildfire among U.S. government intelligence agencies. Suddenly, more and more people are interested in U-234. Now, questions are raised that only POW number IG-557NA can answer. Karl Ernst Pfaff. During his interrogation, Pfaff reveals he was responsible for storing the uranium aboard U-234. The Americans order the containers to be opened. The first question was, we don't believe you. We think this is a... Uh uh, dynamite load that if we open it that we get blown up and I said gentlemen I tell you one thing when we left Germany and when this was loaded we had no idea that we would fall into your hands or these tubes and we were thinking that we would open them ourselves in Japan or Southeast Asia somewhere and we had no intentions of blowing ourselves to hell. I sat there and the poor man, he didn't be believe me very much, but he was under orders to open that thing and he started sweating and sweat pouring down his forehead and he told me he had a family and he didn't want to die young and I should be, uh, should be uh, thinking of that and not let him die. And I said, no, you just open it. boxes with the uranium were lined up on a uh, long table along the side of the uh, building and uh, then a man came in and took a look at everything and every one of the American officers was very polite and really showed respect for him. At a later time when, when I saw his, that picture again in Rust, Louisiana, the prisoner of war camp, I think it was Dr. Oppen Oppenheimer. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the American atomic bomb. A 
a secret military installation in the desert of New Mexico. This is where thousands of Americans are frantically working to build the ultimate weapon of war, the one that shall end all war. They come from all over the world, brilliant physicists, some of them Jews from Germany, on a mission to stop a madman. Among them, Hans Peter. It was our main object to have a weapon against Hitler. And back in 1942, the war looked very bad for the Allies. And so we thought that maybe only an atomic bomb could decide it. First tests in the desert. Success proves to be elusive. The question was, what did they have to do to produce the bomb? What raw materials did they need and how much of it did they need? The scientists couldn't tell him at the outset within a factor of 10, whether it was 10 kilograms or 100 or 1,000, they didn't know. And this was of a substance that had never been produced in quantity before anyway, except in laboratory quantities. What is the critical mass? The question cannot be answered. Not in Berlin, not in Tokyo, and not in the desert of New Mexico. Not yet. We had no idea how long the war might last, and so we wanted the maximum amount of uranium. And this is the man who is going to deliver the very things the scientists need, Major John Lansdale. I was the chief security officer for the Manhattan Project. My task was to prevent information from slipping into the hands of the enemy. Lansdale's mission changes as American troops liberate town after town in Europe. He directs the classified Alsos expedition. Lansdale and his men comb the continent for every ounce of uranium the Germans leave behind after their retreat. I was interested in getting as much uranium as I could. The biggest problem in 1945 for us was to get an ample supply of uranium. Then, he receives the news of the German submarine in Portsmouth Harbor. When I heard about the uranium aboard the German submarine, I got very excited because I knew that we needed all of it. U-234 also interests other departments of the Manhattan Project. Documents from the submarine are rushed to the radiation laboratory at MIT supervised by the National Defense Research Committee, a think tank for the Manhattan Project. I made arrangements for my staff to retrieve and test the material. I sent trucks to Portsmouth to unload the uranium and then I sent it to Washington. After the uranium was inspected in Washington, it was sent to Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, plant K-25. This is where raw uranium is purified and enriched. The German uranium oxide ends up here, in the pile of weapons-grade material that will make up America's atomic bomb. If you have 560 kilogram of uranium, it would have taken approximately uh, a week in 1945 to separate this into weapons uranium. U-234 arrived in America in mid-May. Would the Americans have used the German uranium in their atomic bomb? We wouldn't care where the uranium came from 
We wanted all that we could get. At the end of July, the last shipment of weapons-grade uranium leaves Oak Ridge for Los Alamos, more than eight weeks after the German uranium is seized. How crucial was this material really for the American bomb? How much weapons-grade material would the German uranium yield? 500 kilograms of raw uranium might result in half a kilogram of uranium-235, uh, not enough to make a bomb with, uh, but uh, an important increment. August 6th, 1945, the day that will end the war. Uh, any knowledgeable person that uh, realized that the submarine had delivered 500 kilograms of, of uh, raw uranium would feel that uh, it should be utilized. The crew of the Enola Gay receive their orders. The target is Hiroshima. It's ironic that the German uranium intended for the Japanese was ultimately delivered by the Americans. shown pictures taken from the air of Hiroshima. They were absolutely staggering. We had calculated the likely effect of the atomic bomb, but what we saw was much, much worse. And of course, we could imagine the suffering of the people. When the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th, for me it was evident it had been built with the help of our material. The terrible irony of history. German uranium did not help defend Japan. It contributed to its destruction. The men of U-234, they were neither heroes nor were they villains. They were neither perpetrators nor were they victims. They were simply swept up by the tide of war. A captain and his young crew. Their mission did not make them famous, but saved them from infamy. They were sent to Japan to help continue a senseless war, but their mission was diverted by history, redirected by destiny. The men of U-234 simply survived their journey and may have helped win America's war. The submarine was a godsend because it came at the right time and the right place.